Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon and welcome to this week's Wednesday webinar. Birkit Long is offering a series of weekly webinars on a range of different subjects for individuals, families and businesses. My name is Thomas Emmett and I'm a commercial and corporate finance lawyer at Birkit Long. I will be talking to you today about terms of business and commercial contracts in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and generally. I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague Emma Clark a partner of Burkitt Long in the Wills Trust and Probate team. She will be talking to you about the importance of wills. We will take questions after each speaker, so please do make use of the Q&A facility available. As you can see from the slide, the information presented in this webinar is correct as at the 18th of May 2020 and is subject to any legislative changes that might be introduced by the government. Regarding the agenda for my part of the webinar, I will shortly be introducing my discussion on terms of business and commercial contracts in the context of COVID-19. Before moving on to briefly talk about a distinction between business and business to consumer terms. I then talk about the terms you often find uh, in a set of terms and conditions and I'll comment on the same um, in the light of the current pandemic. Uh, before turning to questions uh, that I've received from my commercial clients relating to commercial contracts over the last few months. I will also suggest some questions you should be asking yourself uh, before entering into commercial contracts or when considering the terms of your current commercial agreements. Finally, I will briefly talk about a recently published government note on responsible contractual behaviour. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many businesses are facing commercial and practical challenges they could never have envisaged. A particular challenge will be cash flow and the ability of businesses to play suppliers and other creditors. A good set of terms and conditions and well drafted commercial contracts can protect your interests uh, as commercial suppliers and assist in recovery of cash for goods and or services supplied. Terms of commercial agreement I will suggest are more important than ever. To be able to rely on a good set of terms and conditions or a well prepared, prepared contract helps out, for example, a uh, is unable to form a contract in whilst also including deterrence relating to lack of payment, amongst other things. As my last bullet point shows there, now is not the time to be cutting corners, in my view, in respect of commercial agreements. It is really important that you are protecting your business as far as possible by ensuring that your terms are up to date and comply with the most recent legislation. As I said at the outset, um, I think it's important initially just to talk about the fact there are, broadly speaking, two types of terms and conditions. That's business to business terms and conditions and also business to consumer terms. Um, business consumer terms and conditions should be used when a business is providing goods and or services to a consumer. A consumer is defined by the Consumer Rights Act as an individual acting for purposes which are wholly or mainly outside that individual's trade, business, craft or profession. There are more statutory controls on consumer terms and conditions than business to business terms including the requirements of transparency under the Consumer Rights Act 2015. 
that being the requirement that terms are clear and understandable as far as possible to ensure consumers understand their rights and their obligations. And the blacklist of terms contained in the same act, which will not be binding on a consumer, even if they are included, with a, included within a contractual document. Those selling to consumers also have to consider the distance selling regulations. For the purposes of this webinar, however, I will be focusing on business to business terms. So turning to the adequacy of your terms and conditions and commercial context, uh, contracts in the context of COVID-19 and generally. I think it's important, first of all, be before going into the specific terms, um, to really highlight that it's important that you make sure that your terms and conditions, as opposed to a customer's terms and conditions, actually apply. A good set of terms and conditions will assist with provisions that ensure that they form the basis of the contract between yourself and a client or customer. You will want to ensure that it's your terms that apply because they contain key provisions for your business which are particularly important in uncertain times, including those relating to payment and exclusion and limitation of liability. Some of you will have experienced circumstances where there's back and forth um, between supplier and customer. Two sets of terms and conditions are passed between the parties twice or perhaps even more than that. And that can cause issues later down the line. Um, if a court is asked to step in and resolve an issue, it could be argued actually by a customer that it's their terms that apply. And a good set of terms and conditions will assist in countering that argument to essentially say, well, no, it's our terms that apply. Um, we've followed the provisions which are called basis of contract provisions within our terms. The uh, part Parties have been clearly following those terms and as such, it is our terms that apply. And as I previously mentioned, the importance of that is essentially you can benefit from the protections within either your commercial contract or your terms and conditions, um, as opposed to the circumstances where actually the customer's terms apply and there will not be uh, those protections. So we've just gone a bit too far here. So I've set out a number of questions on this slide that are actually very important and contain uh, terms that, or issues that quite frankly I see in terms and conditions and commercial contracts um, a lot, but they're not dealt with very well. So for example, uh, the first question is, are your terms and conditions the only terms that apply? And actually your terms and conditions should state not only that the conditions apply to the contract between yourself and a customer, but also should state any other documents that um, form part of the contract. Um, for example, I've seen a number of cover sheets to uh, a set of terms and conditions which state very important things like price, and yet they are not under the terms of the terms and conditions being provided to the customer actually forming part of the contract. And obviously key provisions like that not being included in the contract is essentially in circumstances where, where there is a dispute, an argument for a customer, um, which in turn could lead to um, a dispute which costs time and money uh, of which the latter is very important at the moment in the current circumstances. I discussed um, previously the idea of supplier terms, so your terms applying over customer terms, and that can be dealt with um, for the benefit of yourself by including basis of contract provisions. And essentially what they are is they are a set of terms that set out 
um, how a contract is formed. Now, if you follow that, you are helping yourself win the argument in the worst case uh, scenario that it is your terms and conditions that apply. Um, I have to ask because frankly with the terms and conditions that I see on a regular basis they either don't have those provisions or businesses aren't complying with those provisions and actually it's very important in the current circumstances where disputes are likely to increase due to lack of payment amongst other things by um, customers that actually you're getting this right. And then in respect of implied terms, as some of you will know, in respect of sales of goods and of services, there are terms implied by legislation via the Sale of Goods Act and also the Supply of Goods and Services Act 1982. Uh, they relate, uh, for example, to satisfactory quality of goods and whether they're or not they're fit for purpose. You can have your own terms in respect of the quality of the goods and services, provided they are reasonable. The reasonableness requirement comes from the Unfair Contract Terms Act, and to pass the reasonableness test, a contract term must have been a fair and reasonable one to be included having regard to the circumstances which were or ought reasonably have to have been known to the parties when they were forming the contract, so when they were entering into the contract. In my view, you should be looking to set your own standards as far as reasonably possible and disapplying the uh, implied terms brought about by statutes. Um, this again gives you the level of control over the contract and also allows you to dictate your own terms to the degree that uh, the unfair contract terms allow. Often there will be terms in a set of terms and conditions and also the commercial con any commercial contract relating to goods and services relating to description. Now for some goods um, the description will be relatively straightforward if it's an off-the-shelf good. However there will be some goods that are bespoke either wholly or partly. And again, to avoid the situation where customers are trying to wriggle their way out of commercial contracts, I think it's very important that businesses start looking at producing detailed good specifications and adding them to their terms and conditions and the contract as a whole to form part of the overall arrangement between um, the customer and the business supplying the good. A service specification for those that provide services is also uh, very useful. But again, I point back to what I said earlier. It's all well and good having the good specification and the services specification. But if the terms don't reflect that they form part of the contract, that is going to cause potential difficulty later on and um, should a dispute arise. The key here is to eventually avoid disputes so that you don't have to invest time and money in dealing with those issues. And you can deal with that by essentially having a solid commercial contract or set of terms and conditions. I have quantity and quality um, bullet points here on the slide. I think in respect of quality, I've covered that element, but in respect of quantity, whilst for some goods it's going to obviously be very very clear as to how many goods are um, to be supplied there are certain goods where it's very difficult to actually get an exact quantity and therefore it's very very important that you leave yourself some leeway in your terms and conditions and or commercial contracts um, to ensure essentially there's a little bit of leeway without uh, and without that leeway, you would actually be in breach of contract, which again is opening yourself up to um, disputes. And obviously we want to avoid that in the current circumstances more than ever. If we turn to delivery now in respect of goods, if the goods you sell will be delivered to the customer, it is important that matters such as delivery location, date, time and how the cost of delivery is dealt with are included within the terms. Um, this is really because amongst obviously clarity and avoiding again 
um, disputes, delivery is generally linked to the transfer of risk in a good. And the transfer of risk is essentially the transfer of responsibility for damage to a good. Um, so it is important that any delivery clause is precise and clear. It goes without saying that price is very important and for some contracts price will be fixed, which is absolutely fine and there's no issues there, but sometimes it's not and it's subject to variation or calculated based on the formula. Um, clear provisions relating to how price is calculated is important to avoid, again, any disputes regarding invoiced amounts. Disputes relating to invoiced amounts are obviously or potentially going to delay cash receipts, and that is a very, very key consideration for businesses at the moment. So your terms need to be clear in respect of price. And also equally in respect of payment. One thing you need to be looking at your current agreements and your current terms uh, specifically um, is whether it states that time for payment of the price of goods or services is of the essence. Um, because the law doesn't state that uh, the time is of the essence in respect of payment. Now, why is this important? Because if time is of the essence and customers generally accept that uh, time should be of the essence in respect of payment, you are depriving yourself of certain rights um, which you uh, could potentially benefit from if you state clearly in your terms or in your commercial contracts that actually time is of the essence. One particular right is the right to actually terminate the agreement itself. And why that's particularly important is because an adequate set of uh, business terms or a commercial contract will state that in the event of termination, all invoices become immediately payable. And also for any goods or services provided, but which have not been invoiced yet, you will have the right to raise the invoice and receive payment for those invoices immediately. Should also think about if deliveries are being made by way of instalments. Um, you should think about in your current agreements whether um, you are being paid after each instalment is provided or whether it's at the end once every instalment has been satisfied. I think in the current circumstances and considering uh, issues which I expect to arise in respect of cash flow if they haven't done already, um, you should be looking uh, for your commercial agreements that involve instalments to state that invoices can be raised and are payable um, as and when each instalment is provided. I mentioned about encouraging prompt payment and commercial contracts do have a significant part to play in that alongside standard terms and conditions. One of those is essentially to set an interest rate um, that um, accrues in the event that payment is not uh, made on uh, the particular due date. The rate of interest must not be excessive as it may otherwise be held invalid as a penalty, uh, which is not permissible under English law. At the same time, the interest rate must be suf sufficiently substantial to exclude the late payment of commercial debt interest act of 1998. Where applicable, this act gives simple interest fixed at 8% above base unless excluded by the contract or the terms and conditions themselves. An interest rate of between 2% and 4% above base of a, of a large or major uh, bank is uh, standard within commercial contracts, but we have to consider the fact that interest rates are at an all time low at the moment. And that's obviously something that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, there is a case of Taiwan Scott Co Limited and Masters Golf Company Limited of 2009, which suggested that it may be possible to set an interest rate which is higher than the what is provided for by the Act without it being held to be a penalty. In that case, the interest rate was actually 15%, which 
I would suggest um, now is actually not defensible. So if you're thinking about your interest rate and what to actually include, what percentage to include, I would suggest you speak to a commercial solicitor about that because there are various um, various considerations at play. Um, in respect of other ways in which you can encourage payment, uh, a provision entitling a customer to a discount if payment is made before a specified date uh, would be a good way of ensuring cash flow, ensuring payment in good time. Um, if the customer if a customer is paying uh, a price by instalments, a provision stating that if any instalment is not paid on the due date, the remaining amount, the outstanding balance of the price will become automatically due and payable is actually a very good deterrent. Um, where again, where the goods are being delivered uh, in instalments, uh, a provision allowing you to withhold any further deliveries while any payments are overdue is also a good way of ensuring or deterring uh, customers from not paying. These um, particular bullet points here in relation to risk, title and termination um, are really key uh, provisions within any, sets, uh, within any set of terms and conditions, particularly those relating to goods. Um, and actually, they are just generally points to make uh, rather than just generally in the COVID-19 context. But it is important within any, within any commercial contract within any set of terms of business uh, that relate to goods to state when risk passes. As I previously mentioned, um, risk is when responsibility for damage to goods passes from supplier to customer. Again, it's usually linked to delivery and as such completion of delivery is critical because if the goods are destroyed after delivery, for example, um, it's the buyer's risk and therefore the customer will remain liable for the price. Uh, again, it's a position generally accepted by customers. Uh, the matter is complicated and, and slightly different when a courier is used. Um, and again, uh, I think it's best that you have a chat with your commercial lawyer or alternatively get in contact with me um, if that is the case. Turning to title, um, which is essentially um, ownership and when that passes, um, it's best place to have provisions in your commercial contracts or terms and conditions that relate specifically to title. Otherwise, you are relying on the provisions of the Sale of Goods Act, um, which is not particularly favourable to suppliers. Um, there's uh, the general preference is that suppliers retain title to the goods until payment has been received. Um, most of you that deal with um, selling goods will have heard of retention of title clauses and they are particularly complex and detailed with um, quite a significant amount of case law around them. And if you want more information on retent uh, retention of title clauses, what they are and what they do, um, please feel free to contact me and my contact details um, will follow later on. But it, just a general point to make, um, especially now, um, if a customer is a company and goes into administration, it will be particularly difficult to enforce a retention of title clause within a commercial contract or within terms and conditions, as no steps can be taken without the consent of the administrator or the permission of the court to repossess goods supplied pursuant to a retention of title clause. In respect of termination, um, it's just important um, that in the current climate, issues around insolvency or, of the customer or potentially you can go further if you uh, believe in good faith there is a risk of insolvency to a customer from uh, what you may have understood, that um, there is an ability for you to terminate the contract um, that you have with that customer. Um, it is more important uh, now more than ever to expressly state within the terms what the consequences of termination are, specifically the requirement for customers to pay all outstanding invoices um, immediately and also for your uh, to allow an ability for you to submit uh, invoices for work or goods supplied 
um, that you have completed or have part completed, but you have not yet invoiced for. I'm sure if you've been keeping up to date um, with our blogs at Bucket Long, you would have read a significant amount about force majeure. Um, it's a very hot topic at the moment because force majeure is essentially a legal term, which uh, it, it means an event which cannot be foreseen. And um, I will go on later to state whether actually uh, for uh, this pandemic in respect of particular commercial contracts um, is a force majeure event, but a global pandemic, I would suggest, is a force majeure event just on the face of it in respect of its definition. A force majeure clause included in a commercial contract or a set of terms and conditions typically allows a party who fails to perform or delays in performing their obligations under a contract due to the force majeure event to avoid liability for the non-performance or delay if it was caused by that particular event. These provisions are standard generally um, in commercial contracts and terms and conditions separately, but the comprehensiveness of such clauses varies significantly. For business suppliers, um, the preference would be for a broad force majeure clause. Uh, the broadness would include, uh, would allow for um, provisions that include a list of events that trigger a force majeure um, event, um, including words such as epidemic, pandemic, virus outbreak and government action to name but a few. It would also be prudent to have a, a, a wide catch-all clause and the reason for this is that force majeure provisions are often interpreted quite strictly by judges. Um, so therefore, a catch-all provision might help if the worst was to happen and a matter were to go before court. Now, force majeure clauses can state and refer to economic factors such as profit or uh, increased cost. However, um, because of the strict interpretation of these clauses, it, as an alternative, it might actually be better to include what we call an economic hardship clause in any commercial agreement. They don't tend to be found in a set of standard terms and conditions. Um, such a clause deals with circumstances where a change in economic conditions, which whilst we're not feeling the impact uh, necessarily to its greatest extent at the moment. It is being felt and I feel in a good few months from now um, economic circumstances might deteriorate a little bit more if not substantially more. Um, a clause such as this allows for a change in econ economic circumstances whilst it may not prevent a party from fulfilling its contractual obligations to avoid liability because essentially it states well, in the event that the contract becomes less profitable or more costly, um, liability and performance can be avoided, um, which could be potentially quite desirable. Finally, um, one of the key issues in any commercial contract and a set of standard terms and conditions is limiting or excluding liability. Um, and there are quite significant controls on limitations and exclusions. It would be fair to say that um, you can't go about excluding or limiting every possible liability that um, you may have as a, as a business supplier. The Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977, which I've referred to previously, is a uh, centre, is, is central to this. It is essentially a statute which imposes limits on the extent to which liability for breach of contract negligence or other breaches of duty can be avoided by means of contractual provisions. Certain liability cannot be excluded at all. That includes death and personal injury caused by negligence. There are certain um, liabilities that you can seek to limit or exclude, but they are subject to the reasonableness tests I have previously referred to. Um, and that is uh, the fact that the contractual term in question has to be fair and reasonable, having regard to the circumstances which were or ought reasonably to have been known um, as and when the contract was made. And again, 
this is a, a relatively complex area and I would suggest seeking legal advice and not rely on an exclusion or limitation clause that you have found perhaps elsewhere on another set of terms and conditions or in another commercial contract because ultimately it wouldn't be certain that they have received legal advice and also um, you do not know how up to date that document is that you found. Um, the Act also sets out a non-exhaustive list of guidelines in assessing whether an exclusion or limitation is reasonable. So turning to common questions that I've received um, in the last couple of months relating to commercial contracts during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of them is what is the contractual position if you're unable to perform a contract due to COVID-19? Well, the general rule is that where a party does not perform its obligations under a contract, that gives rise to liability to the innocent party. In order to alleviate a potential liability arising in the current circumstances, you should be looking to see whether you can rely on any material adverse change or force mature clause and in the absence of those, the doctrine of frustration uh, and that, that frustration is something that I will go on to talk about in a moment. I uh, previously uh, referred to this, but uh, there is the question that I've been asked quite often, is COVID-19 a force majeure event? And this depends entirely on the drafting of the, fo the force majeure clause in the contract itself and in your set of terms and conditions. Generally, if the clause is drafted broadly, it is possible uh, that COVID-19 could fall within its scope. Some clauses expressly refer to pandemic or epidemic, which would increase the likelihood of COVID-19 constituting a force majeure event. Would force majeure automatically apply to alleviate liability? And the answer to that question is not necessarily. Mitigation of the event itself is important and you should check the provisions of the relevant clause as there may be a number of conditions uh, that a party must fulfill in order to alleviate, alleviate itself of certain obligations and liability. Common examples of those conditions include a requirement to notify the other party if a force majeure event has taken place in its opinion and there also may be steps to take um, such as uh, mitigation or certain prevention measures. Can you exclude all liability under a force majeure clause? A force majeure clause is in effect an exclusion clause and as referred to previously it is going to be subject to an un the Unfair Contract Terms Act and any force majeure clause that is drafted heavily in favour of one party or is particularly onerous towards a party could potentially if challenged, be struck out for being unfair under the terms of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. What if a contract does not include a force majeure clause? And I mentioned frustration before, um, and this where this is where frustration comes in. A contract could potentially still be terminated on the grounds of frustration. Frustration is when something occurs after a contract is entered into which renders it physically or commercially impossible to fulfill the contract. If a contract has been frustrated, it is automatically discharged, so brought to an end, and the parties are excused from their future obligations. It must be noted the bar for frustration is very high and detailed analysis of the precise circumstances involved would be needed uh, before uh, confidently suggesting that frustration is something you are seeking to rely on. Uh, what steps should you be taking in, relating, uh, in relation to existing arrangements? In particular, you should make note of sums paid under contracts to date and to what extent the contract has been performed. You should also review relevant clauses, force majeure, material, adv uh, material adverse change, uh, to check whether the COVID-19 pandemic is going to fall within their scope. And also, as previously mentioned, there might be conditions precedent such as notice. You need to make sure that you are providing the notice and fulfilling the conditions if you feel you are able to rely on those provisions. Again, if you are unsure, 
um, you should be speaking to a lawyer um, in that regard. In respect of new commercial agreements that you may be entering into shortly um, or within the coming months, uh, these are the questions um, that you should be asking yourself, in my view, um, in, the, in the near future. And this is what you should be considering in respect of new agreements. You need to be clear what your obligations are under any contract and whether you can perform them. Um, how realistic is it that they can be performed due to COVID-19? If there is a risk that you're unable to do so, then you need to consider whether you can put in place any contingency measures which uh, may allow you to actually do that uh, as in perform. Or alternatively, um, agree the measures, the contingency measures with the other party and make sure that is reflected in the contract. Has it been agreed between the parties how risk and liability should be allocated? If performance of the contract is delayed or not prefer, performed at all. In fact, a mechanism in the contract which allows for circumstances such as a second lockdown would be particularly useful, I would suggest. And then think about insurance. I think that is a, a particularly important uh, consideration at this time. Although bear in mind the uh, availability of the insurance and particular products may be uh, limited at the current time. The, the, there has been a document or a note uh, provided recently by the government and my comments are limited to what's actually on the screen because I think it fairly sets out the nature of the note. The government is trying to promote responsible and fair behaviour when it comes to relationships between parties because it's going in their view to have a better long term outcome for jobs, the economy overall and supply chains. The note sets out recommendations for parties and in my view, um, after reviewing those, you should be seeking to take a commercial view um, so that all parties involved can find a way forward without having to result um, to litigation or measures required before uh, litigation. Um, that's it from me. Um, I hope you're still awake. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please feel free to raise them now. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Tom. Um, just um, being conscious of time, we're going to go and have uh, the questions at the end. So we'll now move over to Emma. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Welcome, everyone. Um, so my section of today's webinar will be on the importance of having a will in place. So firstly, what is a will? A will is a legal document that sets out your wishes regarding the distribution of your estate after your death. If you don't have a will in place, you should consider making one. And if you have made a will, but it's been some time since you've made it, um, it may be worth reviewing it to make sure it still does what you want it to. Given that it can be very straightforward to have a will in place, um, it's surprising to know that 66% of people still do not have one. So I'm just going to pop over to the next slide. if that does work. <laughs> Jenny, do you mind helping me just move over to the next slide, please? Lovely, thank you. <laughs> so uh, what are some of the reasons um, why people don't have wills in place at the time? I think this may be, we need to go back one, sorry, Jen. Yeah. 
Jenny, do you mind seeing if we can go back one? Sorry. There's this, there's this and then there's the um, that's the slide we were on, that's the next one. OK, I think we need to just go back. Sorry, everyone. Sorry, Jenny, do you mind taking us back to the beginning? Yeah, of course. Should I do the clicks for you? Yeah, that'd be lovely. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> OK, on to the next slide. Can we go on to the next slide? Brilliant, thank you. So, uh, so what's some of the reasons why people don't have wills in place? Uh, well, a lot of the time it's through misunderstanding about what happens to their estate if they die without a will. Um, and I'll go through a couple of examples with you in a moment. The making of will is often put on the back burner. Um, all too often I've heard people say that they've been too busy to make a will or uh, they haven't got around to doing it yet. Um, and this can be disastrous. Although funnily enough, um, when people are going on holiday, um, it becomes very urgent to make sure something is in place. Some people even think that their estate isn't large enough um, to need a will. Um, it's always worth bearing in mind, and something my husband reminds me of, is that you're actually worth more dead than alive. Another reason that I hear a lot of is regarding expense. Uh, there's a misconception that solicitors are very expensive, but in reality, we're not as expensive as people think. So why should we make a will? Well, for me, I'd probably say it's peace of mind, knowing that your affairs are in order and that your wishes will be followed. I'll mention six of the main reasons why people should consider having a will in place. Reason one to provide for the family's future. It's particularly important that single people and unmarried couples make wills because otherwise they're not automatically provided for. Reason two, reliance on assets being in joint names. It's not always sufficient and it can lead to one joint owner family benefiting. So for example, a couple die together the joint assets automatically pass to the um, second and therefore it's their relatives that will ultimately benefit. And this can be of particular concern where couples have children from previous relationships. Reason three, to leave your estate in an inheritance tax efficient way. Reason four, to make sure that something is in place for children under the age of 18. Reason five, to make provision for vulnerable adults. So for example, to protect the benefits and make sure that these aren't lost when they inherit. And lastly, reason six, um, it's to ensure that ultimately your estate goes where you want it to. Um, this will only happen if no relatives that would benefit can be traced. So it just means that you get to choose where your estate goes. May I ask you to put the slide on, Jen? Thank you. <laughs> so what is in a will? What are some of the things that we need to consider? Executors and trustees. 
in simple terms, an executor is a person appointed by the will to carry out the administration of the estate. In practice, this means calling in the deceased's assets and paying out of them any liabilities, administration expenses and inheritance tax. And once those payments have been made, um, they distribute the estate to the beneficiaries under the will. The role of a trustee is slightly different to that of an executor. Where an executor deals with the paperwork, the trustee looks after the money. For example, a will can provide that children and grandchildren inherit, um, but let's say at a sensible age of 25. So once the paperwork is completed by the executor, they hand over the money to the trustees who hold that until that child or grandchild reaches the age of 25. In simple wills, it's often the case that executors and trustees can be one in the same people, although it's not an ideal arrangement um, for every family situation. Guardians. It's possible to appoint guardians to take care of any minor children if both parents have died. And um, if this is not set out, a court can make a decision in the event of a dispute, for example, if both sets of grandparents are arguing. Funeral wishes. Some think this is a little bit morbid, but if you have particularly strong views, then you can put them in your will. An example of an interesting wish um, was one where a man wanted to be cremated and his ashes interred in an egg timer so that he could be of continual use to his wife. We then move on to specific items and personal chattels. So you can arrange for any particular item, specific item to pass to particular individuals under your will. Business assets. So you can ensure that any business interests are taken care of and uh, pass in the most appropriate way, such as for inheritance tax reasons. And then the residue. Lastly, we need to consider what is called your residuary estate. So this is basically the rest of your estate. Um, note that this doesn't include assets which you own jointly as joint tenants. These assets will automatically pass by survivorship to the surviving joint owner and therefore are not covered by your will. It is possible um, if your circumstances require it for your wills to incorporate certain trusts such as life interest trusts or discretionary trusts. And where you do not leave a will, your estate will be distributed in accordance with strict statutory rules called the intestacy rules. Now, the order of distribution of an estate, um, i.e. who is entitled to what, depends very much on which family members survive. And it can be quite complex, so it's not something I propose to go through in great detail today. Moving on to the next slide, um, couple of examples here. So example one is the married couple with children. Just making sure, Jen, is that OK to move the slide on? I think you must have a delay, Emma. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll carry on talking. <laughs> And so in my experience, um, there's a common misconception that the surviving spouse takes all, uh, but this isn't necessarily true. So we have Mr. and Mrs. Smith. They're married with two children, Smith at one and Smith at two. They do not have wills and the house is in Mr. Smith's sole name and it's worth around £325,000. So does anyone know what happens to the house when Mr Smith dies? Well, the rules changed recently as of the 1st of October um, 2014, and the law provides that Mrs Smith would receive a statutory legacy of £250,000. She would also receive the personal chattels, but the balance of £75,000 over and above is divided into two equal parts. One half goes to the children at 18, the remaining half goes to the spouse absolutely. So you can appreciate this is probably not an ideal situation. So problem number one, the statutory legacy of 250,000 to the surviving spouse, is this gonna be enough for her? 
or him for holidays, for doing up the house. Is he or she going to be happy about it? Probably not. Problem number two, everything over and above the statutory legacy is divided into two, with one half going to the children at 18. So co-ownership with children can lead to many problems. So what happens if they want their money? They divorce, they become bankrupt or they die. This could leave the surviving spouse um, in a very vulnerable position. And problem three, inheritance tax may be incurred if the estate is big enough and some IHT may be payable, which could probably have been avoided if a will was put into place. And then we go on to example two, unmarried couples living together. So you may have heard of the term called common law husband and wife to describe a situation where an unmarried couple live together. This concept doesn't exist in legal terms. And as such, if a will isn't made, then the surviving cohabitee will not be entitled to anything from the deceased estate. I am, of course, ignoring here any jointly owned property, which may pass by survivorship, uh, depending on the nature of the joint tenancy. Unmarried couples living together um, is, of course, an increasingly common social trend, particularly in the over 55s um, and a situation um, that such couple should be very careful. Of. So to sum up, um, it's extremely important to make a will. And once you've made the will, we say review it every three to five years or if anything significant happens. Um, just to make sure that it does still achieve what you want it to. That now brings my um, talk to an end. So I'll say thank you and apologies for the um, disruption earlier. Um, before I take any questions, um, I'd just like to say we'll be sending a recording and any notes around to everyone that signed up today's for today's webinar tomorrow morning. Um, we will also include a link to a very short feedback survey. Uh, which we uh, would very much like you to complete just to make sure that our future webinars are helpful to you. Um, as you're aware, this is one of a series of our Wednesdays webinars. Um, we're taking a break for half term next week. Um, but when we return on the 3rd of June, um, the session will be about growth during COVID, looking at flexible working, restructuring and intellectual property. Um, it's for employers, HR professionals, directors and business owners. So please visit our website or our event bright page to sign up. So now happy to take questions. Thank you, Emma. Um, we haven't actually received any general question, questions for answering live, um, but the direct questions that we have received Tom and Emma will follow up with these tomorrow. So I can pass back to you, Emma, to um, wrap up. Thank you, Sarah. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we will uh, review any questions not answered and try to make contact with everyone we haven't had time to respond to live um, and uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you.